You're listening to episode 54 of the Confident Writer Podcast with Jane Pike. Hi team fabulous, how goes it out there today? Oh, it has been just a corker of a week. (laughs) I don't even know how to describe the week that I have had and I'm not going to attempt to, save to say that usually when it comes to recording a podcast, I have a loose idea, a little way out, what it is that we're going to talk about. And today, about 30 to 60 seconds before hitting record, I decided what our topic du jour was going to be. (laughs) Now, part of the reason it has been a bit of a kerfuffle getting to the place of hitting record is because I've been pouring all of my energy into redoing my membership program, Joyride. I'm so excited to put it out there. Honestly, I'm really passionate about this material. And the exciting next stage for me, the exciting development, is bringing in aspects of mindful movement and movement for nervous system regulation into the content that I have that is mindset based. Over the last couple of years, I've really been getting into this in a big way personally. And I feel like now is a really good time to be able to present what it is I've been working on to you all, because I think it's a game changer. I really do think it's a game changer. So when it comes to movement, the type of movement that I'm talking about is not exercise movement. It's not about you going for a run. It's not about you getting more strength or kind of, you know, opening your hip flexors in in the way that we might traditionally understand it. I'm talking about movement that is specifically designed to widen our window of tolerance, to increase our capacity and to allow us to come back down to a stable baseline so that we can make good decisions for ourselves and for our horses in the moment when we need it such a fascinating adventure. I've already been going down this path with the existing members in Joyride and I've seen some incredible changes. So I'm really excited to get it out there in a more structured way. I did think about kind of tacking it on. I don't know, it's not quite the right way to say it, but you know what I mean, sort of like adding it in to the program as it exists currently. And then when I sat down and started writing it all out and looking at how it was that it was laid out currently, I was like, actually, I just want to take it from the top. So it's been a huge undertaking, a huge undertaking, but a really, really worthy one. And I think it's really unique in terms of what is being offered right now um, in the area of sort of psychology and, and how we're approaching work with our horses. So if you want to be a part of it, there is a wait list at the moment that you are able to join. I'm not working with anyone new currently, so you can't sign up to Joyride right now, um, but you can join the wait list for when it opens on June 15th. So if you want to do that, you can jump on my website, confidentrider.online forward slash joyride. I've also had some emails from people wanting one-on-one coaching, which is something that I do also, but for the similar reason in that I feel like all of my zest is going into producing this new content, I've decided to just put everything off until mid-June. But if you want to join the waitlist for coaching as well, you can jump on the work with me tab on confidentwriter.online and you'll see all the details there to do that. It would be amazing to work together once I've got all this stuff down. It's been such a huge part of my life. I mean, the somatic uh, practices I have, I'm a yoga therapist as well, and I've done lots of movement therapy training. So it's been beautiful to kind of marry it all together. And that's come a lot through my own personal integration with stuff where You know, when things just sort of make sense all of a sudden and you're like, huh, how did I, why was I not doing this before? So yeah, really, really excited, very experiential, very practical. And I've already seen some huge changes in people that I've been working with, with this stuff already. So super, yeah, like I say, keep repeating, super, super excited. It is true. Super, super excited to get it out there. Today, what I want to talk about is mindful anger. I think anger is something that we have a fairly crappy relationship with for the most part. And even mentioning anger in relation to horses and riding can bring up a variety of different opinions. I put a post up 
about anger a couple of weeks ago, and it was one of the most well-received posts that I've ever read, (laughs) ever written rather. And I also had a couple of people who completely misconstrued what it was that I was expressing um, and sort of thought that I was advocating the idea of getting angry when you were riding a horse in terms of losing your temper. And this is a this is also a curiosity to me that, you know, we don't have the kind of relationship with the feisty emotions that allow us to see them within a useful context. You know, we automatically default to considering anger to be something that is bigger than our bodies, that results in some kind of violence or harm to someone or something outside of ourselves. And that is not the anger that I am referring to. But part of the reason I think that we have such a poor relationship with anger is cultural and especially for women because it is not, we are not encouraged to express ourselves, express discomfort, express, you know, I don't know, outrage is kind of not the right word that I'm looking for, but like express words that say or express feelings that say that is not okay for me or that is not what I want. And I see this all of the time. I'm, I talk, I reference women, A, because I am one. <laughs> there you go. Handy hint. But also because 99.9% of the people that I work with are women. And so this is coming up in my professional experience as well. Many of us have, from the beginning, really poor boundaries. We are, have a, a low level of differentiation between what it is we actually feel or a poor level of congruency between actually feeling like we decide something for ourselves one way or the other. So if someone asks us something, maybe we say no on the inside, we feel no, I don't want to do that. However, we say yes. So this kind of disparity between what it is that we feel and how it is that we respond and act. And when we've done that over a long period of time, when we haven't actually been acting in alignment with our true feelings, then it creates this murkiness and level of shutdown where we actually don't get clear messages anymore, where the walkie-talkie system or the communication system between our gut and our brain is so poorly used and underutilized that we, we switch off from what the messages actually mean in the first place. And if you think about it, the actual expression of anger as a woman or as a little girl growing up, is not something that's encouraged. It's something that is actively discouraged. It's not in our social narrative at all. I think for boys, it's something that's much more widely expected. It's kind of like the boys will be boys thing, and there they go, having the fisticuffs and wrestling and all of that sort of thing. But for girls, it's really not something that we, as a culture, encourage at all, right? So, What you'll see for the most part is when we are out of whack, so when we have, when we're not in our window of tolerance, when we're not regulated, when we're not coming back to a stable baseline all of the time, what you will see is more women defaulting to anxiety and fear than defaulting to anger, than defaulting to the fight response. So let's talk about the nervous system a little bit to give this a little bit of context. When we are under threat, our nervous system responds with either the want to flee or the want to fight. So these are examples of us extending outside our window of tolerance and needing to mobilize or protect ourselves in one way or feeling the need to mobilize or feeling the need to protect ourselves in some way. Now, that fight response is a really healthy one. There will be times when we do need to defend ourselves, when we do need to protect our own integrity in whatever manifestation that that comes up. And in a healthy system, in a healthy environment, that would be something that is actively encouraged. So it doesn't mean that the flight or fight response is a bad thing. We want those things when we need to be able to protect ourselves. But when that is actively discouraged, so when we feel ourselves go into a fight response, say as a woman, vastly generalizing, but I still think perhaps it's not so much at the same time, 
when we feel ourselves wanting to go into this fight response and everyone around us and our conditioning tells us that that's not appropriate, we channel that energy into anxiety and fear. That is a more appropriate expression for a woman of concern than actually feeling like we need to meet the situation head on. So over time, we stifle this fight response. We stifle this what can be in some situations healthy response to a situation where we don't feel good about things or we are under pressure in some way. And we automatically default to any type of activation in our system being anxiety and fear because that is more socially acceptable. It's much more socially acceptable to be anxious. It's much more socially acceptable to be fearful than it is to be pissed off. (laughs) Not many people can cope with pissed off. And you think about how that is received. If you think about what the general ramifications or the general labels are of a pissed off woman, they're not flattering right? They're generally not flattering. We don't get the warrior woman images. We don't get peppered with Xena warrior princess in terms of like a feisty woman. We get peppered with very much uh, not flattering associations with an angry, angry woman. So I know if it it might feel like I'm kind of deviating a little bit off the topic, but this cultural discussion is actually really important because then we start to contextualize how it is our conditioning is affecting what it is that we're expressing. And what I see time and time again is people presenting with anxiety, saying that they feel anxious, saying that they feel afraid. But actually, when we scratch the surface, it's not anxiety that they're feeling. It's frustration. It's anger. It's feeling like they've been slighted in some way. But because it doesn't feel appropriate to express that energy in its purest form, we default to what does feel appropriate and just automatically label everything that we feel that is kind of activating in that way as a form of anxiety. I don't think all anxiety is anxiety. I think that we have lost the ability to articulate and to differentiate between the specifics of what it is that we're feeling. And so we have, as a society, started to group things in these very generalized areas when actually, if we are to reassociate ourselves with what it is, the pure form of what we're feeling, if we do start to actually identify what it is and, and, and are able to label what it is that we're feeling, then we can really get down to business because we learn that actually it's not initially what it appears. So if you take that... If you take that and then you think about how it is we would develop healthy relationships with things, it becomes kind of confusing. It becomes kind of complicated because we have this murky water. It's like there was a clear pond and all of a sudden the rock fell to the bottom and the silt got stirred up and now we just can't see anything. We can't actually differentiate anything. The bottom, the middle, the top, it just all looks the same to us. Mindful anger is when we are able to be in touch with an activating emotion that liberates the fight response and it doesn't become bigger than our bodies. So when I talk about capacity, when I talk about operating within your window of tolerance, I'm talking about your ability to stay with big emotions and big experiences, including anger, and not feel the need to flee or to respond in a way that means that you are no longer in charge of the emotion or the experience, but the experience is in charge of you. So most of our associations with anger refer to situations where we are operating outside of our window of tolerance and the emotion or the experience has become bigger than us. That's where our lid has flipped, metaphorically and literally, (laughs) and we are kind of out of control. You know, that's where harmful situations arises, be that emotionally where we're harmful with our words and physically where we're harmful with our actions, a combination of both of those things and anything in between. The mindful anger that I am referring to comes 
with clarity. It comes with me recognizing where it is I begin and where it is I end. It comes with me recognizing what is mine and what is yours. It comes with me recognizing what it is that is acceptable to me and what it is that is not acceptable to me. It comes with me recognizing what I want in my experience and what I don't want in my experience. And through that differentiation, through that autonomy, I can then understand what it is I'm feeling, have a clear label for what it is that I'm feeling and be able to act in accordance with that, which means that everything that I decide to do from that moment on is within my conscious awareness. I am aware that in response to this experience that I am having, I feel a certain way. It might feel big. The energy of that might feel big. It might feel powerful, but I'm still able to contain it and I'm able to move with that experience in a way that provides the most effective outcome for myself and for my horse. So anger then can be an incredibly beautiful experience. Anger is a very activating energy. The same energy of anger is behind motivation, is behind dedication, is behind forward propulsion. It is a mobilizing force that propels us to take action and also allows us to put a boundary in place that can protect us or defend what it is that we want in a way that is really healthy, in a way that is really healthy. So how then does mindful anger apply in the saddle? What is it exactly that I'm talking about here? (laughs) Anger to me, mindful anger is essential activation. It is the uprising of power. It is the state of being that allows us to assume a posture of integrity and dignity and say, come on, let's do this. You know, let's take up all of the space that's available to us. Let's tap into the ultimate strength that we have available to us and bring that forward. Let that be what presents in this situation. So many times we go to our vulnerabilities and it is absolutely important, no doubt, to acknowledge and to share and to hold to the light the parts of us that need to be supported and need to be nurtured and need to be held. You know, I absolutely acknowledge that. But at the same time as that is present, what is also present is a huge amount of strength in us, a huge amount of innate capacity. And we need to learn to tap into that in order to be able to really allow our horses to be expressive, in order to be able to harness that forward momentum, in order to be able to really channel what could be seen as a healthy competitiveness, right? Or a healthy capacity to be able to meet something and say, yeah, I can do that. Let's do that. And this is where having a relationship, a good relationship with mindful anger is so important because mindful anger is our warrior. Mindful anger is the foot in the stirrup that's like, come on, we can do this together. Let's go. We have more, you know, let's show them what we're made of. That is the the mindful anger component that I'm talking about. It is not abuse. It is not violence. It is not causing harm. Mindful anger is holding space for big energy. Mindful anger is showing up with motivation and determination and forward vision and literally holding your space so you feel your backbone, so you feel that excitement, so you feel that essential aliveness that makes you want to stand up, take notice and be noticed. And that is something that we need to train ourselves into. We need to train ourselves into that because we have what I've noticed to be an issue with holding activation. We need to be able to make space for that. We need to train ourselves into the ability to be able to be with big energies and big experiences and to not let them get bigger than our bodies. 
when we don't allow, when we're able to do that, I'm going to not use the negative. I was going to say when we don't allow them to get bigger than our bodies. But what I want to say is when we're able to hold them, then we stay within that experience, but we have all of our wisdom available to us. So all of the wisdom that allows us to maintain the soft hands, that allows us to move in sync with our horse, that is not something that's disabled. But in addition to that, we can say, let's go. Let's take this to a a bigger level. Let's take this to the next plane. Let's really move things now. And our ability to be able to do that is directly related to our ability to hold big emotions out of the saddle. You know what else? What's really important to understand is that when we're able to do that for what we might perceive as kind of hard experiences, like anger can it not necessarily just be this powerful uprising. It can also be being able to hold a tremendous amount of discomfort and yet still move forward, not be disabled by that. But our ability to do that is directly proportional also to our ability to stay with joy, to stay with excitement, to stay with anticipation in its best form, because that is hugely activating as well. You know, that that liberates a massive amount of energy in our system. And you see difficulty holding that also, right? Like your ability to, on a very fine level or the very base level, receive a compliment, to allow something good to happen to allow excitement to build without feeling like you need to erase it in some way. That's also activation. That's also related to our capacity. So mainly what I'm wanting to put out there today is this musing for you to think about how it is your relationship to that fight response is, to that anger, to that power, to that uprising. Do you let yourself tap into that? Is that something that's illegal in your mind or shameful even? How often do you let yourself be expressive? Are you stuck on a dial emotionally or physically? Do you have this association where everything that you experience that you perceive as an energetic influx in that way is automatically put in the anxiety bucket? Do you need to start to siphon things out to have some differentiation between sensations, experiences, feelings, so that we can really be articulate about what it is that we're doing? And beyond that, be able to recognize what's happening so that we act in a way that's congruent and that lets us stay in flow with our experience. It's fascinating. It's so fascinating. Maybe I will read you the post to finish off. Let me see if I can pull it up. I'm going to read you the post to finish. This is the post I wrote a couple of weeks back. Anger has a bad reputation, and frankly, I'm bored with it. So many of us have been trained out of our anger, trained out of the essential energy that gives us a backbone, trained out of the zest that lets us feel a level of intensity in our body that commands that we hold our ground, be taken seriously, are not available to be pushed around or talked out of what our instinct and intuition are telling us. We are told countless times that it is not appropriate to be angry, that our fierceness has no place, that it is unkind, uncalled for. We confuse anger with abuse, with violence, with causing harm. But it is none of those things. Anger is fire. It's activation. It's power. It's a state of being that says... I am not available to be treated this way. That says, here is the space I am holding and it's mine to hold. Anger is the warrior. It's the uprising of breath that assumes the posture of integrity and dignity and says, come on, let's do this. We are not available to be made small. And that does not sit right with me. Anger is an essential uprising if we can learn to hold its fire. We need more warriors. Have a great day, team. I'll catch you in the next episode.